thing. I want to begin talking about the kingdom of God. Uh, some background. I talked about this. I've talked about this many times because it's, to me it's an exciting subject. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. And it's a thing I think that uh, we haven't always thought about uh, in the way I'm going to talk about it, in the way I have talked about it. Let me put it that way. Okay, we give some background. I talked about this quite a bit when we studied uh, the parables. The Old Testament, it ends on a note of unfulfilled hope. You see, there's this note of unfulfilled hope in the Old Testament. It was clear that in, in one sense, God always had ruled the world from the time of creation. There is a sense in which that's true. He's always ruled the world from the time of creation. He was on his heavenly throne you see that in Psalm 11.4, Isaiah 6.1, and he reigned over all, 1 Chronicles 16.31, Psalm 93.1, 96.10. But there's a sense, you see, in which his kingly rule was not being fully expressed. He is sovereign. He's king over all. But there's a sense in which his rule is not being fully expressed. He was allowing creation to go on out of step with his ultimate intention for it, to continue in a state of brokenness, to go on in a state of sin and suffering that was contrary to his eternal purpose and vision. He's allowed the broken world to continue. So is he sovereign over all? Yes. Is he on his throne? Yes. But there's a sense in which he's not asserting that rulership in a way he one day will so that all things will be in harmony with his ultimate intention for creation. So this was something that you can see in Scripture was understood, but the prophets, they saw that a day was coming in which God would express his rulership over creation in a way in which all things are going to be brought into harmony and conformity with his ultimate will and his ultimate vision. His creation would be redeemed from the dreadful consequences of sin that had invaded it. Something has happened. God creates and pronounces it very good, but something has happened. You and I know, living in this world, that it is broken. There is sin and suffering and mourning and pain and death and all of that. Something is not right. And a day is coming when God is going to assert His rulership in a way that this world of rebellion, sin, hostility, fragmentation, suffering and death is going to be rescued by God, redeemed, and transformed into the true utopia, this perfect reality of love and joy and fellowship with God and one another. That day is coming and that has always been the vision that the people of God have looked for. Let me read to you. I have some quotes. I know some of you don't like it when I quote uh, scholars. But as I've said before, I could simply say it. You're here listening to me. And maybe that's at gunpoint. But if you're here and you think I have anything of value to say, why is it objectionable if I find somebody else who has something of value to say and I just read it because I like the way they say it? Right? Right? I mean, I'm not inspired, they're not inspired, but if I see somebody who's studied and I say, I like this, then I'm reading it to you. Now, I could just take it and tell you it was my idea, but I don't work like that. (laughs) Okay, so that's a footnote on that. All right, Bartholomew and Goheen, this is is from their book, The Drama of Scripture, Finding Our Place in the Biblical Story, uh, published in 2004. It says, the people of Israel thought of history being comprised of two very distinct periods the present age and the age to come. In the present age, which had begun with Adam's rebellion against God's rule, the whole of creation had been stained by sin. Inevitably, therefore, evil would continue to flourish in the world throughout the present age, even among God's own people of Israel, who had been called out to provide the solution to that evil. But in the age to come, God would intervene to cleanse and renew His creation. On that day, God would express His authority over creation. He is sovereign. But on that day, He would express His authority over creation in a way He was not doing at present. He would, in His sovereign power, bring creation to its ultimate fulfillment. At that time, He will be king. He will be king as it says in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, in a manner unlike the present. Is he king? Is he ruler? Yes. 
But is there a sense in which he will be king? In a sense in which he will take his sovereignty and express it over creation in a way that all things will be fixed? Will be brought into harmony with his ultimate? Yes. That's the hope. That's the vision. God is going to set all things right. Robert Saucy says in his chapter on eschatology in the Bible from the Expositor's Bible Commentary, he says, According to the Scriptures, there's a sense in which God has always ruled and is even now the king over all creation. Cites some text, Chronicles 29, 11, Psalm 103, 19. But there's another thread of truth that views the kingdom as yet to come. Zechariah 14, 9, Matthew 6, 10. It is this last theme that dominates the eschatological hope of Scripture. While God rules over the affairs of the earth with nothing occurring apart from His permissive will, He has allowed sin and rebellion to enter history and Satan to have a certain dominance as the God of this age. God's rule might be said, therefore, to be over the earth, but not directly on the earth. Whether you like that characterization or not, what he's saying is that God has allowed this brokenness to occur and continue, but he said he's not going to allow it to go on that way forever. He's going to fix it. It is the coming of God to establish this latter condition, to bring his kingdom to earth in the vindication of his sovereign holiness that has constituted the hope of God's people throughout all time. This is what we're looking for. This is what Israel was looking for. This is what we've all been looking for. I. Howard Marshall, he's another New Testament scholar, he says in his book, Jesus the Savior, the kingdom of God is the full and powerful manifestation of the sovereignty that God already exercises over the world. It is the full and powerful manifestation of the sovereignty He already exercises. It is when He will come and assert that authority in such a way that all things will be brought into harmony with His ultimate will. That is it. It's, the, it's this divine utopia that God is going to bring about. Now, the Old Testament, it uses different imagery to refer to this blessed state that God is going to create. It has a number of different pictures that it puts out to refer to this. The imagery, it varies in how sharply it distinguishes the blessed state from our present existence, but all of it says, all of these pictures say, in forms that would be relevant to ancient Jews, that a time of divine blessing is coming. It says that the failures and the sufferings of the present age would be put to rights in the coming age. But there are different pictures of how that comes about. Sometimes the Old Testament speaks of the restoration of Israel to greatness and of the, and the coming of a new king like the great King David. Sometimes it speaks of God's healing of the world's sicknesses and hatreds. Sometimes it speaks of God's people being freed from oppression. Sometimes it speaks of renewed prosperity and justice for the poor. Sometimes it speaks of war and the weapons of war being abolished. Sometimes it speaks of death being swallowed up and tears being wiped away. Sometimes it speaks of alienation between God and man being removed. Sometimes it speaks of God's Spirit being poured out in a new way, and sometimes it speaks of a new heaven and a new earth. All of these are pictures that are saying, unlike this broken world, a time is coming when God is going to set things right. God is going to fix things. Now, in the first century, Israel is weak, poor, and under pagan rule. They're dominated by Romans, pagans. That's their state in the first century. Graham Goldsworthy in his book, According to Plan, The Unfolding Revelation of God in the Bible, he says the, the return from exile, you remember they're exiled, and they go into Babylonian exile, 587, 586. They go into exile. He says then, then they return. He says in 539 the return begins. He says the return from exile results in only a pale shadow of the predicted glorious kingdom for the people of God. That's why I said, see, the Old Testament ends on a note of unfulfilled hope. It is not like God has promised these things. We go into exile, we return, and that's it. That we're now living the fulfillment of all that God had know, you see. There's this, there's this sense of, wait a minute, there's something else that God has promised. This isn't the fulfillment of the magnificent vision 
that God has prophesied. And here's what uh, Thomas Schreiner, now he's a New Testament scholar, this is from his book, uh, New Testament Theology, published in 2008. He says, the prophets promised a new creation, a new temple, a new covenant, and a new king. The exile would be over and the wilderness would bloom. The great promises in the prophets, however, were not fulfilled when the exile ended in 536 B.C. Israel did return from Babylon, and a temple was built, yet the temple was insignificant in comparison to the Solomonic temple. Nor was the nation enjoying glorious prosperity, the kind of glory envisioned in Isaiah 40 to 66. Israel was small, struggling, and under the oppression of former powers. Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi document the low spiritual state of the nation. Nor did matters improve in the 400 years before the coming of Jesus of Nazareth. Israel was a pawn in the struggle between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. A brief period of freedom dawned with the Hasmoneans in the 2nd and 1st centuries B.C., but the interlude was brief, and soon the Romans swept in and subjugated Israel, appointing the Herodians and, uh, and procurators to rule the land. This is, this is the state of the people of Israel in the 1st century. This is what's happening. They're saying, look, there's something else going on. The people they longed and they prayed for. In the first century, this is what they're doing. They're longing and praying for the coming of God, for this final intervention, when He would set all things right to the, in the fullest sense to the blessing of His people. This is what they were looking for. They were waiting for this. In Mark 15, 43, Joseph of Arimathea is described as one who was waiting for the kingdom of God. He's waiting for the kingdom of God. This is what he's looking for. He's looking for this assertion of sovereignty that brings about this divine utopia. He was waiting for that state in which God expresses His sovereignty by heavenizing creation. That's my word, but I like it. Heavenizing creation. That to me is the concept by transforming this fallen creation into the divine utopia, into an eternal state of love, joy, peace, and ultimate fellowship. The perfect existence. The perfect reality. This is what they're longing for. And it was into that religious, social, and political environment that Jesus comes saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom is at hand. (laughs) The time is fulfilled The kingdom of God is at hand. Mark 1.15, he says in Matthew 12.28, But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Whoa. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This kingdom that we've been longing for, that we've been waiting for, the kingdom of God has come upon you. Luke 17.21, he says, For behold, the kingdom of God is among you. You see, Jesus comes announcing the arrival of God's final intervention in history, this ultimate expression of His kingly rule on the world. Let me read to you what David Wenham says. David Wenham was a lecturer in New Testament, Oxford University for many years. He says, to sum up, in proclaiming the kingdom of God, Jesus was announcing the coming of God's revolution and of God's new world, as promised in the Old Testament. God was at last intervening, Jesus declared, to establish His reign over everything, to bring salvation to His people and renewal and reconciliation to the world. But fortunately, Jesus didn't announce His message in such general theological terms. He announced it primarily through vivid, concrete parables. And we went through the parables, spent a long time going through them. I tried to bring those things out and bring them to your attention. Now this naturally, this created a great deal of excitement. You know, excitement, you can imagine. People have been waiting for a long time. This is the hope of mankind, the hope of history. He comes saying, the kingdom of God, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. So you can see why people say, well, how did Jesus get such traction in this buzz? Here comes a miracle worker announcing The arrival of God's long-awaited kingdom, well, you can believe that it created excitement, but it also created suspicion and opposition in other quarters. There was great excitement, great crowds, great buzz. 
But there was also opposition and suspicion. It also led to a misunderstanding because of incorrect ideas the Jews had about the coming and the nature of the kingdom of God. They had some things on wrong, and Jesus was going to have to correct those misconceptions about how this kingdom of God for which you are waiting comes. He had to set some things straight. Many of them thought the kingdom would arrive through or in conjunction with military conquest. See, they thought that, or more specifically, through or in conjunction with the expulsion of the Romans and their supporters from Palestine. They thought, listen, that's how it's going to come about. We're going to have some uh, great ruler arise. We're going to give the Romans the boot. We're going to become a dominant military power. We'll basically rule the world and all will be well that way. So there were some that had that concept, but as Wenham notes, he says, Jesus had in mind a bigger revolution than that. God's revolution was to be a total revolution overthrowing Satan and evil and bringing earth and heaven back in harmony. And this would not be accomplished by force of arms, but unbelievably so far as the disciples were concerned, and who blames them through suffering and death. He has something bigger in mind and a different way of bringing it, bringing it about. Now they also expected that the kingdom, of, they expected the kingdom to come suddenly and decisively. This is a crucial thing. The Jews looked forward to this day they had been waiting for. They looked forward to the kingdom to come suddenly and decisively. They thought, of, they thought God's intervention was going to be a one-shot deal. The day of the Lord where the old age would be terminated abruptly and the new glorious age would begin. This was their picture. We're going here. Boom! New age. This is how they understood it. You remember Luke 19.11 where the people supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately upon Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem. This was going to be the time. Here we go. And there it is. So Jesus had to straighten these things out. Their aspect of thinking, Wenham has diagrammed it this way. I've shown this to you before. I've shown this to many people before. But here you see the old age, their concept, old age, day of the Lord, new age. That's how they envisioned the coming of the kingdom of God. That's how it would play out. And this caused people to wonder, well, how could Jesus be ushering in the kingdom of God? How can it be possible that He is ushering in the kingdom of God when all these hallmarks of the old age, all of these hallmarks of death and mourning and suffering and pain and division and fragmentation, all these marks of brokenness are still here? How can he be ushering in this when all of these marks of brokenness are still here? And you remember, even John the Baptist began questioning as he sat in Herod's jail whether Jesus was in fact the one who would bring the kingdom of God. You say, how could that be possible? He testified to it. You sit in a jail when you have certain expectations of how things are to play out, and you tell me. It makes perfect sense to me. Actually, did I make a mistake? Are you the one who is doing this? Why is Herod still ruling? Why does he still have the power to throw me in jail? I'm a righteous man. The kingdom is to reverse all that stuff. You're bringing the kingdom and I'm rotting in jail. I don't get it. So you see that this was something that happened. Jesus, of course, he explained in a number of parables and elsewhere that the kingdom comes in two stages. He told parables specifically on point that the kingdom comes in two stages. It is introduced or inaugurated, as it's currently or commonly said in theological studies. The kingdom was introduced or inaugurated. Then there's an interval of time. And then there's a decisive intervention when the kingdom is consummated Or finalized. So you have an inauguration where the kingdom is pulled in, it begins, there is a period of time, and then there is this final intervention when the kingdom is consummated. You say, well, I've, you know, I don't know about that. Let me give you, I could give you many people. I've told you before, some years ago, I was at a, a, evangelical theological society conference and the guy said, one of the guys there, um, I can't think of his name right now, 
That's just the way it works when you get older. Uh, Brian Vickers. I went to a talk. He's a New Testament scholar. And he said they're hoping that Jesus comes back soon so they can stop talking about the already and the not yet. It's at that level of understanding and acceptance, you see. So I want you to see some of the things I want you to see. What I'm saying to you is not the least bit weird. If it strikes you as weird, I'm standing in a big stream. Okay? A lot of people sit here and say, all right, yeah, we're all on the same page. From all kinds of different groups. So what I'm saying to you, so sometimes when I quote people who are, who are scholars, you can say, okay, maybe it's not weird. Maybe this guy just didn't dream this up himself. Okay, so that's part of it. Samuel Michalaski says, while Scripture recognizes the reign of God as being eternal, it acknowledges that his sovereignty in the evil-infected world is only partial in the sense he has not fully expressed it. You see, Scripture declares that God's universal reign will be achieved at Christ's second advent. This reign, however, has already broken into history in the incarnation, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. In that complex of events where Christ comes to earth, lives and teaches and dies and is resurrected and ascends to heaven, in that complex of events, the kingdom of God, this eternal age, is pulled into the now. Does that make sense to you? I mean, this idea is the best picture I can say that it has invaded the already. It exists presently, but it is not currently the sole reality. We live in an overlap of ages, and I'll show you a diagram for that in a second. Here's how Preben Vang and Terry Carter in their book, Telling God's Story, they say, according to Jesus, the kingdom of God is already here. Jesus inaugurated it. The age to come has broken into the present age. God is making His presence felt already now, yet the kingdom of God is not here in full. Evil still exists. God does not yet fill all in all. This will only happen at the time of consummation when Christ comes back. We now live between the times. The promised age to come has already begun, but is not here in full. The old age is still here as well. You see, that's why what I mean when I talk about an overlap of ages. Here is a poorly drawn diagram. But this is from David Wenham's book. And this is the idea. And I think it's depicted here. Do you see, we have Jesus coming where the kingdom is inaugurated and brought in, but the old age continues until Jesus' second coming, and then the kingdom goes on as the sole reality. You see, so the kingdom is a present reality, but it's not the sole reality. And there's a time is coming when that kingdom will be consummated. So Jesus, when he said these things in the context where people were expecting here, boom, there, he had to straighten them out. You see, he's a theologian. What do you think all this stuff is he's talking about? Why doesn't the Bible simply say, Jesus came and died for our sins? Why does it have all of his teaching in it? Well, it doesn't matter. It's just about he came and died. What is it? What is all this stuff he's saying? Okay, he's saying a lot. And this is part of it, and this has tremendous implications for how we live. Now, there are texts in addition to the parables that indicate that the kingdom of God is a present reality between the first and second comings of Jesus. And there are texts in addition to the parables that indicate that the kingdom of God is a future hope. That is why you constantly run across, I don't know what you read, but if you're reading in certain quarters, you'll constantly run across the phrase, Already and not yet. Already and not yet. And that's why. That's how you put these things together. And so this is, you'll, you'll see that. So Walter, I mean, I mean, Robert Stein, in Walter Elwell's, he edited the Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology. This is a common uh, resource. Okay, and here's what Robert Stein says. The kingdom of God is both now and not yet. Thus, the kingdom of God is realized and present in one sense, and yet future in another sense. This is not a contradiction, but simply the nature of the kingdom. You see, the kingdom has come in fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. The new covenant has been established, but its final manifestation and consummation lie in the future. Until then, we are to be good and faithful servants. We are in this overlap of ages to reflect 
the vision of the eternal state. See, we are to be people who are working in conformity with what is the eternal state that God is building? What is His eternal vision? Well, it is one of peace and harmony and love, and we are to live in accordance with that. You see, so it has, it has great implications. I've told you before, I love that uh, I can't quote it. I don't have it down here, and I can't give it to you directly. But uh, N.T. Wright, I love this imagery that he has about the, uh, the medieval stonemason, who you have an architect who is, has plans for this magnificent cathedral. And he sends out and has these people, you know, just uh, peasants or whatever, these people working on a block of stone. And they're just chiseling away, and they have directions that you are to make this block of stone a certain way. This person working on this little stone has no idea of the structure into which the architect is going to take his small little labor and turn it into this cathedral. But the architect knows. You see, and that's how I look at our lives. As we build and live consistently with the kingdom, God is going to take all that we do that is consistent with his kingdom vision and somehow bring that as part of it. And in fact, I think that's part of the idea, when this idea of people escaping from the flames and they come out with nothing because they have built in consistently with the eternal vision. If they had built consistently with that, there would be something there to be incorporated. Okay, that's a footnote, so I'd have to develop that more for you. But I think this is, you know, it's not like we shy away from this stuff because we think, well, listen, eschatology, end time stuff, these kinds of big things, that's all pie in the sky. That's all future stuff and we live in the here and now. Let's get practical and let's talk about here. And I think there's a tremendous price for that. New Testament theology is eschatological at its core. This is what's happening. You see, that there's been this tremendous shift and change. And this is what we look for. So, I mean, I just think that, that when we say that, you see, you, we're robbing people of a great deal. And so I'm happy that you have gotten questions about it. And let me go off and say all this. Okay. Now, at Christ's return, see, that redemption that began nearly 2,000 years ago, it's going to come to completion. You see, where we have, we have this inauguration, this kingdom, all these things. So what do we, like in Revelation 21, what do we see? We see coming down out of heaven, that's this picture of heavenization. You see, and you see it in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10, where this idea is what is God's purpose? What is His plan for the administration of the working out of the end of the ages? It is this idea that, listen, we're going to heavenize creation. We're going to unify all things in Christ. And so you see, like in Revelation, we'll just say, what do we have? Then there will be no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain, for the old order of things has passed away. You see, and you and I, as I will say, when we get, when we get, next week I'm going to talk about some aspects of the second coming, and one of the things we'll talk about is resurrection. So you and I will then participate in a redeemed creation, we will live in a redeemed creation. The new heavens and new earth. You see, creation itself has been affected. As Paul says in Romans chapter 8, all of creation is groaning, having been subjected to futility. This is the curse. This is part of the dreadful consequences of sin in this world. All of creation is waiting for the redemption of the sons of God. So what? Together, you see, we will be redeemed in that fullest sense of having resurrection bodies and we will live our lives in a new heaven and new earth that God is making that's going to be a perfect dwelling, a perfect place. And you see, in that reality, what will it be? It will be nothing but love and joy and fellowship in the immediate presence of God. See, I mean, there, there's no hope like that. That's why I pull my hair out when the society spends all its time on things that are relatively trivial, right? And we, we don't talk about this. We don't talk about what is going on, what is God doing, where is creation going? We talk about and, and get worked up about so many other matters. But Christ is going to return. The redemption 
that he began nearly 2,000 years ago will come to completion. See, this is, is the time when in Revelation 11:15 the heavenly voices say, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. You say, what do you mean? I, he's reigning. I know He's reigning, but do you understand the sense then? Do you understand? See, at the consummation there is a sense in which His reign is finalized. And that sense has been introduced and begun. The seeds have been planted. We've had you know, something put in that spreads out, and what does it wind up in? It winds up in this. You say, how can your small, tiny beginning, Jesus, how can you with just a handful of people have the audacity to be saying that you have launched the kingdom of God? Look at it. It's nothing. And then he tells these parables. You see, you've got a seed. What does it wind up doing? it winds up becoming something you couldn't imagine. You see, he tells many things like that to get them to see you're thinking about this in the wrong way. There is the inauguration, there's a period, and then there's something you can't believe. And I have, in fact, ushered in the kingdom of God. And you and I, see, we participate in that. See, when we come and say, yes, Jesus is Lord, when we become Christians, we are entering into that reign that has begun. We are submitting to that reign. And we're participating in it. And you see, okay, Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord. And that's, that's the time when in Revelation eleven seventeen, the 24 elders say, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. What do you mean God? What do you mean and begun to reign? Was there ever a time God didn't reign? No. But is there a sense? Yes. You see, there's a sense. Is God always on the throne? Yes. But here he says, take it and begun to reign in this final, consummated sense where you have the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, at Christ's return, the kingdom that he's inaugurated, the first coming will be consummated or final. See, this is the expectation. That that's, this is what's behind Peter's statement in Acts chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, where he, Peter says that Christ must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets to fix the brokenness. You see? He must remain in heaven until God's time to fix the brokenness. That's what Peter says there. And it's, it, it is the coming of the kingdom in this consummated sense for which Jesus instructed his disciples to pray in Matthew 6.10, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I know I've heard many different takes on that. Okay, I'm convinced the correct understanding of that is he is saying that we are to pray for the consummation. We are to pray for the assertion of God's sovereignty in this world so that this creation is heavenized. Kingdom come by will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That your tolerance of all that is broken and the rebellion and the fragmentation will be ended and everything will be in perfect harmony with your ultimate will and purpose. Okay, Matthew 6, and I think that's the right reading. I'm not alone in that. Now, some aspects of the second coming, I don't really have time to launch into it, but uh, you know, Jesus leaves no doubt that he's coming back, right? I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. He promises to return, or he speaks of his return in many passages. And I have this, and you, know, you can see these on the website. I could read them to you, but he does this in many places. Peter and Paul speak frequently of that event. For instance, Acts 3, 17 to 21, 1 Peter 1, 7, uh, 1, 13, uh, many passages from both Peter and Paul. John refers to the second coming several times. 1 John chapter, 1, ver chapter 2, verse 28, chapter 3, verse 2, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, and on and on. I'll pick back up there next week. So I want to look at some aspects 
of the second coming. And that's going to involve, we'll look at his coming, we'll look at some of the judgment, we'll look at some of the resurrection, and a lot of things. Hopefully I can finish that part of it next, next Sunday. Then I'll take one more Sunday to look at the intermediate state of the dead, meaning the state of those who die in the overlap of ages. See, what is their state? Okay, and I'll take a look at that and give you my thoughts on that. Thanks for coming.